Uh, let's jump into it this morning. We're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 3. If you have your Bible and want to turn there, uh, you can go ahead and do so. If this is the first time or first time uh, in a little while, we are continuing in a discipleship series we started back in the fall called Foundations. This is about how to either build or rebuild your life with Jesus at the center of it all. And so we're talking very specifically about 30 beliefs, practices, and virtues that are going to help us know him really, really well, do what he calls us to do, and be like him in everything. These priorities of a disciple of Jesus Christ we've talked about uh, all year long now, and so that we would know him well, do what he calls us to do, and then be like him in everything. And so we're in that last virtue section. Only got a few more weeks before July, and we wrap it all up uh, just before we get there. But the sixth one I want to talk about here today is the virtue of wisdom. Uh, that we would know how to walk in godly wisdom when things are not exactly black and white. And so it makes sense that we're going to be looking a little bit at the life of King Solomon right here, since he is widely known as the wisest man who has ever lived, right? And so that's not just Christians talking about that. You Google it, and Google's going to put King Solomon at top, and so it must be true if Google says it and stuff like that. But uh, they're all going to acknowledge, like, King Solomon is one of the wisest men who's ever lived. Anyone want to take a guess at some of the other people that hit that top five list of wisest people to ever live? Who would you say? Bono. Okay, I didn't hear that one first hour. He was not on that list, but I can see why he would, he would need to be there. So uh, who else? Who else would you say? Anybody else? Okay, first service is a lot more talkative and stuff. Other people were talking like Confucius and things like that. Um, Buddha was on, was on there, number four. They did put Jesus up there. Weird part, they put him behind King Solomon. Anyway, it's one of those Quora lists and things that aren't really reliable or anything like that. Uh, Mr. Miyagi made the list, y'all. Uh, Mr. Miyagi, I was so excited to see that because I think he's a very underrated wisdom guy. Um, I, I think some of the greatest like Miyagi quotes and stuff out there, either you karate do yes or you karate do no. You karate do guess so, squish, just like grape. Right? I mean, like, like, who can argue with that? That is words to live by forever. Man who catch fly with chopstick, accomplish anything. Right? Uh, I mean, that's some pretty incredible stuff. And King Solomon's wisdom was even greater than that. And so that's who we're, that's who we're looking at a little bit today. Um, he is the author, the human author of best-selling hits like Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and of course, like every teenager's favorite book, Song of Solomon. And, uh, and so if that weren't enough, he's also widely known as the wealthiest person to ever live and to ever walk the planet. Anyone want to take a guess what his estimated net worth would be today if he were alive today? $2.1 trillion was number one. $2.1 trillion. I think it's a little skewed because it's, um, it's, it's counting like all of Israel's wealth, which he was over and he had access to. So I don't know that it's the exact same thing. Uh, Rockefeller was number two at six hundred and sixty. Four billion dollars, I believe. And then, of course, today you've got people like Elon Musk, who's at $230 billion net worth, Jeff Bezos at $140 uh, billion. So, like, get that. Like, Musk is at 240 or 230 Bezos is at $140 billion. But it was said of King Solomon that he had so much gold in his possession, made all the silver in the land completely worthless. Can you imagine, like, having so much gold that silver in the land meant absolutely nothing to anybody else? Uh, and granted, like none of that has anything to do with being wise. None of it is an indicator of godly wisdom. What it does mean is that he was a man with options. He was a man with opportunities at his fingertips, the ability to do whatever he wanted to do. He was a man that had incredible amounts of power over other people to do things that he wanted to do. And it means that he knows how hard it is to discern what is good and holy and right in a world that's not exactly black and white. And so what do you do when you don't know what to do? That's the question of the text and the question I want to deal with a little bit this morning. First, Corinthians, or First Kings chapter 3, again, is where we're going to be. And if you're not familiar with this part of this story, uh, King David has passed away, meaning King Solomon's time has now come. He is the son of David and Bathsheba, meaning he was raised in a lot of dysfunctional environments, dysfunctional family practices and things like that. You remember that story, David and Bathsheba, the trauma that took off from there. David killed Uriah, who was Bathsheba's husband at the time. It stimulated all kinds of nonsense at the family that went on for a really, really long time. 
And in the middle of it all, God saw fit to be faithful to keep his promise to King David that the lineage of the throne would continue on through his line. And so that's what's taking place as Solomon comes and takes the throne. David's passed away. Solomon's a teenager. He's now the king of Israel. He's actually walking faithfully with the Lord, and so things are going really, really well. We read at the beginning of this chapter, he's just made 1,000 burnt offerings to the Lord at a place called Gibeon. And so here's what it says beginning in verse 5. The Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream and said to him, ask for whatever it is that you want me to give to you. Uh, it's a dream we've all had before, right? <laughs> like That's the dream that movies are made of. Typically, there's a gold lamp and a genie, and you get three wishes, and hey, you can't ask for more wishes and things like that. Uh, what do you typically wish for when that's the scenario that's played out to you? If God were to come to you and say, hey, you get one thing. What's one thing I can give to you? You ask it, and I'll give it to you. What's that one thing that you're going to ask for? I mean, would it be the $2.1 trillion that he gets later on in life? I mean, typically, that's where we're going to go. It's going to be typically things like money, more power, thrones, abs, you know, great clothes, popularity, uh, things like that. Here's what he says in verse 6. Solomon answered, he said, You've shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and he was righteous and upright in heart. You've continued this great kindness to him and you've given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you've made your servant king in place of my father, David. But I'm only a little child, and I don't know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people that you've chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or to number. And so give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people to distinguish between right and wrong, for who is able to govern this great people of yours? It's a pretty incredible request, isn't it? I mean, of all the things that you can ask for, God, hey, God's coming and saying, hey, you got anything. I'm your genie in a lamp, if you will, and I'll do what you want me to do. Of all the things he could have asked for, this is what he wants. He's sitting there kind of going, okay, I want wisdom, and I want a discerning heart. I want to know what you think about how things should be. I want to know what you would have me do in the middle of the complexities of this life. He's sitting there going, I, I, I want to know how to govern your people well. Can you imagine if the leadership today asked that question all the time? God, more than anything else in this world, like, I want to know how to care for the people you've given me to care for. The President of the United States, more than anything in the world, more than power, more than fame, more than my agenda coming in, I want to know what your agenda is, Father. More than the right, more than the left. More than these things going on, like, God, I want to know how you think about things. I want to know how you feel about these things. I want to know what wisdom looks like from your perspective so that I know how to care for the people you've given me to care for. Can you imagine what a world would look like if we thought about the responsibilities and the people that God has given to us in such a way? Father, these kids that you've given to me, Lord, who am I to care for them? God, I want to know what's wise in your eyes and how I'm supposed to raise them. I want to know what wisdom and goodness and holiness and righteousness looks like in the complexities of this daily life. This is what he says, Father, when I don't know what to do, I just want to know what you would have me do in the middle of this situation. <clears throat> so he says in verse 10, the Lord was pleased that Solomon asked for this. In other words, like he's happy to give it. And he says, so God said to him, since you've asked for this and you've not asked for long life or wealth for yourself, I'll do what it is that you've asked. I'll give you a wise and discerning heart so that, there will have never, so that there will never have been anyone like you. Moreover, I'll give you what you haven't asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you'll have no equal among kings. What do you think, church? Do you think that the Lord was faithful to, to keep his promise? I mean, we're still talking about King Solomon to this day as the wealthiest man who's ever lived and the wisest person to ever walk on this planet. And so I want to define this real quick to, so we can understand a little bit about what he's talking about. The word that he uses right there, it literally means skilled and learned. That's what wisdom is, is to be skilled and to be learned, meaning it's the ability to skillfully discern truth from untruth and right from wrong. Truth from untruth and right, and right from wrong. And so godly wisdom is very, very similar. It's the ability to know and apply God's goodness and truth in situations that are not exactly black and white. Immediately you can see some of the tension that we may be having today when we're talking about defining what's true from untrue and what's right from what's wrong. 
You can imagine the tension uh, that, we're talk- that we're dealing with today, trying to discern what wisdom may look like in a culture that doesn't acknowledge that things are right and that things are wrong, that things are true and that things are untrue, that there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to destruction. Nevertheless, this is the pursuit of King Solomon right here, the ability to know and apply God's goodness and truth in situations that are not exactly black and white. In other words, wisdom goes beyond the things that are crystal clear. Wisdom goes beyond the things that he's made plain and clear and simple in the truths of God's word. In other words, when you're driving down 635, that person cuts you off. You don't have the freedom to go down there and to run them off the side of the road just because you're angry, right? Scriptures are really, really clear about what he says about violence and vengeance and getting payback and things like that. Like that's a matter of black and white. Wisdom is not needed necessarily in that matter because he's made it really, really clear. If I like my neighbor's car, I don't get to go take it simply because I like it because scripture has been really, really black and white. What Solomon's after in this text is the wisdom you need when you're sitting there going, Father, I have no idea what it is you want me to do. God, all I can see is a world of gray around me. What would you have me do in the complexities of the world that I'm in right now? Am I supposed to marry this person or not? Am I supposed to go here or not? Grad school or not? Do I take this job or do I take that job? Do I pick up my family and move around the country or not? Do I go to Harvard or do I go to A&M? Clearly, you need to go to A&M, he says. Um, There's a tough one a little while ago. Family came and talked with me about how do I discipline my kids in a way that lets them understand the severity of the situation but doesn't crush them in the process? Complex. How do I discipline this kid who's very, very different from this kid? How do I motivate this child over here who's incredibly different from this child over here? You've noticed this. Your third is not the same as number one. Your fourth isn't the same as any of them. Like, it's just odd, right? And you're sitting there kind of going like, what does wisdom look like to parent this particular student, this particular child, in these particular set of circumstances, at this particular age, and at this particular point in maturity? Like, what does it look like to have grace and truth in the middle of this really, really, really complex situation where I love this person, I'm in relationship with this person, however, I cannot support the things that they're deciding to do? Like, what does grace and truth look like in that situation? How do I approach this really complex, hard situation in a way that's going to be winsome and true at the exact same time? Like, should we do public school? Should we do private school? Should we do homeschool? in this age that we're in right now? Do my kids need something different from me that they need from their father or from their mother? Is this a time that I need to speak up in defense of the voiceless or do I need to bite my tongue and sit on it a little while and let the Holy Spirit come and do things that my words will never be able to do? Or is this one of these times the Holy Spirit is gonna use me and my voice and my words to go in to bring justice to the weak? Like, what does wisdom look like in these situations? This is what wisdom is. It's the ability to know and discern and apply. really is what it is God would have you do when you don't know what to do. And so this is what he asked for. And again, notice in the text that this is God being really, really happy to give it. In other words, he's looking at Solomon going, hey, you could have asked for anything in the world. But because you asked for wisdom and your heart is in a place, you're understanding the responsibility that I've given to you, the opportunity at your fingertips to govern a nation that is my people, and you want to know how to do it well, I'm happy to give that to you. And just a point of reference, church, that is always, always, always going to be a request that he's happy to come and to give. And so a couple of things, a few observations about how to get it. Number one, it does begin with a healthy fear of the Lord. And I think we're going to see this in Solomon's story right here, but Wisdom does begin with a healthy fear of the Lord. We see it all over the story, the amount of deference, the amount of flattery that he gives right here at the beginning of the text. Even before he gets the request, verse 6, you see it in here. You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David. In other words, God comes and says, Solomon, what do you want me to do for you? There's deference. There's lowering of himself right here. You've continued this great kindness, he says in 6. To him, you've given him a son to sit on the throne this day. You've made me your servant, the king, over your people in place of my father David. I mean, the whole thing is dripping with deference and flattery out of fear and reverence for who God really is. Apart from that, like Solomon's going to actually write this in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, where he explicitly states, wisdom begins, or the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, is what he says in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. And then, of course, 12 other times all throughout Proverbs, 
King Solomon's going to be writing, and he's going to talk about the wisdom of fearing God rather than the futility of fearing man. In other words, what he's going to be saying is, hey, it is right and good and wise for you and my, me to have an attitude and a perspective of God where we rightly fear him instead of fearing the people that we're around. Don't be afraid of your brothers, your sisters, your neighbors, your friends, the crowd, the mob, whether what's going to happen to you or anything like that. No, no, no. Don't be afraid of people around you. You need to fear and have a healthy reverence for the God who is able able to bring things into being. This is what he's saying right here. Wisdom begins with a healthy fear. In other words, like wisdom begins with a sober reverence and awe for the one who is the beginning of all things, for the one who speaks and literally universes come into being. It is right and good and holy for us to fear him. It begins with an understanding that he's the one who's going to judge the living from the dead. He's the one who grants the authority, the opportunity for eternal life. He's the one who knit us together in our mother's womb. He's the one who created us and knows how we were wired and designed to flourish. And so what he's saying is it's wise for us to have a healthy, sober fear and reverence and awe for him, the one who has the authority over all life and all death. And granted, I think it's a little odd for us to be thinking about fearing God this side of the new covenant sometimes. I don't know if you feel like that from time to time, but knowing Jesus his life and death and resurrection, the humility in which he lived, the way that he loved, the way that he gladly laid down his life for the flourishing of us all. How do we talk about fear in that kind of a context? Seems a little bit weird to talk about fearing God this, this side of the new covenant. But the reason it starts there is because there's nothing that creates faithfulness faster than when you and I see the God that you rightly fear and we see him that he chose to give us grace and kindness and mercy and love instead. Like there's nothing that creates faithfulness faster. This is why wisdom begins with the right fear of God. There's nothing that creates faithfulness faster than when we see that that God who is rightly to be feared chooses grace and kindness and mercy instead. I've told you before, one of my heroes growing up was Goldberg. Had a really weird fascination with wrestling stars, especially in the college days. Early on, we found ourselves... Uh, we were working a WCW event in College Station. They came into town, had an opportunity to meet Goldberg. I was not expecting to meet Goldberg. Goldberg was that guy that made The Rock look really, really small. Like, that's Goldberg. He was a terrifying individual, but I was fascinated with him. Anyway, we come to this event. I was dressed up as Sting that day. I think I've told you that, that story, but I uh, thought it would be wise. I loved Sting also, but I was dressed up as him. That's Goldberg's nemesis, who he's going to be fighting a little bit later that day. But we got there early. We're setting things up. I'm walking down this back hallway as I'm kind of dropping off some things. And this is before all the crowds get there. The guys are out there practicing on the stage. But I'm walking down this back hallway when all of a sudden Goldberg comes from the other end of the hallway. And it's like me and him in this hallway. And y'all, I'm dressed as Sting. And so, like, I, I, I never regretted dressing up as much as I did that day. But, like, he comes down there, and I'm going, oh, my gosh, it's Goldberg right there. And I'm, like, I'm keenly aware of how I'm dressed. And, like, I'm his arch nemesis and everything. And, like, I was terrified. And he sees me, and he looks at me and stuff. And then Goldberg decides to mess with me. And he gets down on his floor. You remember the, probably not. I'm really hoping nobody else knows this. But this is, like, his death stance. Like, he would get down there, and he would do that. Like, like that's right before he would kill somebody. Basically, he would, like, spar them and lay them out in the ring. And so he does that in the hallway, and like, I'm terrified. I'm like, oh my gosh, Goldberg's going to kill me. This is kind of awesome at the same time. And, um, and then he just kind of straightens up, and he starts laughing it off a little bit. And he starts, he, like, you can see how terrified I am. And he comes over, me and he shakes my hand. It makes me feel like a small little child and stuff. It just like, kind of like, crushes my entire arm. But he comes over, and he shakes my hand. He's like, it's good to meet you. And we start chatting just really, really briefly. I'm telling you, like, I was a fan for life after that moment with Goldberg. Because like when absolute power, like the person who can crush you and end your very life chooses grace and kindness and mercy instead, like I'm telling you, like there's nothing that draws you closer faster than that. And this is what John Newton writes about in Amazing Grace. Every time we sing it, we know this story. This is what he writes about in Amazing Grace. If you know a little bit of his story, he was a slave trader before he came to faith. And this is his story. He comes out and he gets on a boat and he goes into the middle of the sea in the middle of a slave trade. And he's out there in the middle of a massive storm. The waves are crashing in. He thinks it's all going to end. He's afraid for his life. And he throws out a little Hail Mary, essentially. Father, if you really exist, God, if you really exist and you save my life, I will give you my life, he says. Sure enough, the storm subsides. He goes to the land. He goes back home. He repents of his sin. 
And he says, God, I believe that you're there. He comes to genuine faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God begins to change his life. And then shortly after that is when he writes the lyrics to Amazing Grace. And we sing them all the time. And we love them. Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. And now I'm found. Was blind. But now I see. I love that next line. It says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." What's he talking about? Like, how does grace teach your heart to fear? You ever think about, like, this is what he's saying. "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." What he's saying right there is, like, it was your grace that was there that day in the storm. Your grace brought that storm, and it gave me an awareness that there is a God in heaven who controls the sea and the wind and the storms in this life. It was your grace that made me aware that this whole world isn't just about me. It was your grace that made me so terrified of what was going on that day that it awakened me to the reality of a God who is in charge and in control of all these things. And so he says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." But then the next line says this, my, "'And grace my fears relieved.'" So it was grace that taught my heart to fear, and then grace my fears relieved. In other words, that exact same grace that taught me to be afraid of you was the exact same grace that relieved those very fears and knit my heart to you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. In other words, like I was lost and dead in my sin. I was on a ship running far, far away from you. I was selling people made in your image. I was, I was doing the thing no one in their right mind should ever do. I was dressed like Sting and essentially mocking your name. And in the middle of that place, the God who controls the wind and the storm and the seas saw fit to love me and to continue giving grace and mercy to me. That God saw fit to save me and to pluck me out of that predicament and to save me through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now... I see. Church, I'm telling you, like, there's nothing, there's nothing, nothing, nothing that creates faithfulness faster than when you and I look at our God and rightly fear him with a healthy fear. But we understand that that God who is rightly to be feared chose grace and mercy and kindness and love instead. Like, what else are you going to do but sing and give him the glory in the entirety of your life when you realize that that's who our God is? It's why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Without fear, you're never going to have an appreciation for the amount of grace that he's actually given to you. And without an appreciation and understanding the amount of grace that he's actually given to you, you're never going to be compelled to draw near to the one who can actually wisely, wisely lead you throughout the course of your life. And so Solomon says, yeah, wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. And I would ask you this question when was the last time you sat there with an awe and with a reverence and with a healthy amount of fear for the understanding that there's a God who speaks and the universe is coming to being and I am not that God? There's a God who's going to rightly judge the living from the dead, right from wrong, truth from untruth, and I am not that God. Our schools are not that God. Our government is not that God. This culture and the whims of today are not that God. When was the last time we sat there with a healthy reverence and awe and respect and fear, understanding that there is a God, and one day I'm going to stand before him, and I'm going to be fully and completely dependent upon his grace and his mercy for my well-being for eternity? When we see the God who is rightly to be feared, and we know that that God chose to come and to take on flesh and give me grace and mercy instead, I'm telling you, worship will be the result. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. It's where it begins. Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. We continue with number two, and it, it's that we, don't, we, we do need to ask him for godly wisdom. I do like this about the text. The question is posed to Solomon, what would you have me do for you? And Solomon asked him, I would love for wisdom, the ability to discern what's right and what's wrong, what's true and untrue, so that I know how to govern your people really, really, really well. Keep in mind that when Solomon makes this request, he's not doing it as someone who is completely and naive and doesn't already have wisdom in the first place. Chapter 2, King David is speaking to him and he acknowledges that a young Solomon is already a young man with an incredible amount of wisdom. And so it's not that Solomon is lacking for, for wisdom in and of himself. He's just lacking a certain kind of wisdom. And this is what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 when he says, When I came to you, I didn't come in persuasive words of human wisdom, 
But I came in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and his power that our faith may not rest in the wisdom of man, but in the very power of God. In other words, when I came preaching to you, I didn't come just telling you what I think about life. And I hope you know, like, this is why I, I pray this prayer all the time. You probably heard it from me a number of times. I, I, I always pray, Father, let my preaching today not be in persuasive words of human wisdom, but a demonstration of your spirit and your power. <clears throat> That our faith may not rest on the wisdom of man, but on the very power of God. What you need and what I need is not what I think. What our world needs is not a lot of human wisdom. What we need is a word from the Lord so that we know how he is defining what's true and untrue, what's right and what's wrong. And so this is what he says right here. This is the kind of wisdom that he's asked after. And so he asks him for it. Can I have the ability to discern as you would discern in these trying times? And the question I would ask you today in this is, is this where we typically go to find our wisdom today? Is this where you go? In the complexities of life, when everything around you is gray, all you can see is fog, is this the place you go to first to discern what it is that you're supposed to do? Are you aware of your default and where you typically go? I was thinking about that a lot this past week, and I was reminded that my default is typically to look inside. When, when I sit there in confusion and I see all the gray and I'm sitting there complex, what do we do about COVID? What do we do about justice? What do we do about all these different tough things in 2020? Which isn't just 2020, it's life. But like, what do we do about all these tough times? I, I, the t- place, my default place to go is to typically look inside. I'm a person that loves logic classes all throughout college and things like that. I like problem solving. I like a challenge. I like to be able to say, hey, there's a problem over there. Let's figure out how we can go and solve it. I don't know if anybody else can identify with that at all or not, but typically my default is to say, I'm going to grab the bull by the horns. I'm going to try to figure this thing out and we're going to see what wisdom really looks like right there. The problem with that is that God's wisdom often defies our logic. Like God's wisdom doesn't always make sense in that moment. It's not the thing that's always logically what we're supposed to do. Genesis chapter 6, God tells Noah, I want you to build a giant ark for a flood that the world has never even seen. Like, that's not a logical thing to do. It's why the people that thought, that, that, that looked at what Noah and his family were doing, and they thought, like, that man's lost it. He's crazy. I want you to build a giant ark for a flood that the world has never even seen. Genesis 12, he tells Abram to pack up his family and to go to a place he hasn't even shown him where to go. In other words, pack up your family, tell them we're moving, You don't have a plan. You've got no clue where you're going, but guess what? I know where you're going, and so trust me, and I'll show you where to go along the way. Church, like, that doesn't make logical sense. I was talking with a friend a little while ago. He was telling me about this family and this group of families inside of his church that retired a little bit early. They sold all of their things. In perfect health, they chose to move into a retirement community so that they can establish a church plant among a people that typically aren't able to physically go to a church. Church, that's not a logical thing to do in the prime of your life when you've got money and wealth and opportunity to retire and play golf and collect seashells on the sand and things like that. It's not a logical thing to say, you know what, I'm giving it all up because there's a people over here who typically are not able to join other people in worship. And so we are going to go to them and join them together and worship. Praise God Almighty. He doesn't do the things that are always logical to do. It's just not what he does. It's not logical to sell all your things and move to Alaska and to go help people on islands that don't have access to the word of God or the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not logical to give away a majority of your income to expand the kingdom of God and to say, you know what, my life is not in this life right here. My life is in the kingdom that's still to come. None of those things are logical things, but this is what he does and this is what we do because his wisdom often defies our logic. And some of us are sitting there kind of going, okay, well, guess what? Logic's not really my thing. I've never thought twice about anything a day in my life. I'm kind of more of a heart person. I like to trust my gut. I like to do what my heart tells me to do. But it's the exact same problem because God's wisdom often defies the heart. Is this not what Jeremiah talks about? which we quote here all the time, the heart is deceitful above all things without cure, he says. Who can understand it? The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand? In other words, he's sitting there kind of going, it's not wise to declare something true and good and holy simply because you feel like it's true. This thing that we're experiencing today that's going, hey, whatever you feel like is true, he's going, no, 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 that's not wisdom. That's not wisdom. I mean, a little bit later on in 1 Kings chapter 8, Solomon's going to pray the dedication of the temple. Lord, turn our hearts back to you. In other words, our hearts are prone to wander. He's acknowledging that reality right here. No, no, no. Like what's true in here for me 
This self-truth, what I feel like is really right? No, 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 my heart is prone to wander. My heart is prone to go up and down, pinning the circumstances around me, pinning sometimes what I ate last night for dinner. Like it makes no sense to trust what I'm feeling in that moment. It makes no sense for a child to make that decision when they think they're Batman one day and they wanna be Spider-Man another day. It makes no sense to trust what you're feeling and to look at that inside as the heart, as the decider of, hey, this is true and this is untrue and this is good and this is not really good. I'll never forget a little a number of years back, it was during the refugee ministry days, but we were renting an apartment over in Vickery Meadows where we operated a lot of our ministry out of. And so we would be over there in the day I was working again with an African refugee fellowship, most of them from Burundi, Rwanda, and some of that surrounding area. And uh, we would spend a lot of time in that apartment meeting with new families, helping them meet their needs and get uh, apartments and pray with them and all these different kinds of things. And quite honestly, I remember sitting there one day, it was the end of the day, at the end of the week, I had a million things going on for school at that time that I was really stressed and worried about. And honestly, it was one of these days I was ready to get home. I remember sitting there in the apartment and we'd kind of done our stuff for the day and we were waiting for this family uh, to get into town. We knew they were coming to the community there pretty soon. And uh, it was kind of kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed. Finally, they arrived at the end of the day. And I was like, okay, uh, let's go meet them. And we went over there and uh, they invited us into their apartment. It was completely empty. It was uh, a Burundian family. They spoke a different dialect than the other Burundians that I was with. And so we got in there and we had a really hard time communicating because of the language barrier that was there. And so for about 15 minutes, we're sitting in there. We're trying to figure out what are your needs? How can we pray for you? How can we care for you? Things like that. And it's just really going nowhere. And uh, I'm finally getting anxious and stuff like that. And finally, about 15, 20 minutes into it, this guy comes in who is also from Burundi, but happens to speak their dialect. And he's able to come in and be a perfect interpreter into this situation. And so we sit there and we're able to understand their needs. We're able to pray with this family. We're able to walk through the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We walk through some of these basics right there. Mom and dad and younger sister come and they place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They immediately get connected with the Burundian fellowship that is right there in our neighborhood. And I would, so, I would tell you still to this day are still a part of that African refu- refugee fellowship to this day. Church, praise God Almighty that his wisdom often defies how we feel. I did not want to be there that day. Didn't want to be there. Was tired, was exhausted. How many times have you been out there and you sat there and been like, you know what? God moved in power when it was despite how I felt that day. Praise God Almighty, that's our experience, that God calls us to go to places we don't want to go. That he calls us to do things we may not want to do. That he calls us to say things we may not want to say. Praise God Almighty, that his wisdom defies how we feel. And some of us are sitting there going, okay, well, logic's not really my thing. Heart thing's not really my thing. Quite honestly, I don't really trust myself. And so I go to my friends. And of course, the problem with that is who in the world are your friends? Like, why in the world are we sitting there going like, that's the wisdom, that's the supreme authority for wisdom, when guess what? You're my same age. You got the exact same problems. I'm asking you about financial wisdom and advice when sitting there. You got more debt and less life experience than I do? I mean, think about like, who in the world, what are your qualifications for the friends in your life? I mean, some of us are so desperate for wisdom, we're willing to listen to anybody. Podcasters who have no idea the truth of God's word, they are the ones who get to direct our lives. Bloggers who do the exact same thing. News outlets who thrive on war, who thrive on our fighting who want to divide and conquer into political camps as if our political camps were the supreme authority on what's wise and good in this world. Not discerning through the truth of God's word, defining how we live and what we believe and what we feel. Medical advice from a guy standing outside a gas station in Florida on YouTube was sent that video during COVID. Church Solomon's got access to wisdom. He's a wise young man. He's got access to friends and the scribes and the people in his life. But what he needs is a different kind of wisdom. And so he decides to go straight to the source. Father, I want to know what you want me to do. I don't care what all these other fools think over here. Uh, That may be helpful down the line if that's the last thing. But the first thing, God, I want to know what you want me to do. Father, in this situation, discerning these days and these times... And this particular school and these particular temptations and all of these different tensions, Father, I want to know what you would have me do. 
I want to know how you think in this matter and what love and grace really looks like in the middle of this thing. God, I want to know how you think. I want to know how you feel so that you're going to be glorified in the end. This is where it all begins. A healthy fear of God. I'm your servant. I'm deferring to you. God, I submit to you in all these things and a willingness to ask. God, I need you to speak into this thing because I'm not able to come and to bring my wisdom. In fact, I am able to do that, but guess what? My experience shows me it doesn't really get me very far, hence the world we're in here today. And so this is where it all begins, a healthy fear and a willingness to ask. And the last one I want to point out is that wisdom takes practice and learning the truth of his word and letting the spirit lead. It's the definition of the word. It's a practice. It is a learned practice over time and practicing the truth of his word and letting the Holy Spirit lead. Again, don't miss that a young Solomon is already quoting back the promises of God that were made to his father David. This is where he is. God comes to him in a dream, and young Solomon is already reciting the promises of God back to God in the middle of this prayer. In other words, he's raised in the home where he had King David to rightly raise him in the truth of the Torah in that day. He's a man who passed on the promises of God that uniquely he made to David, Solomon was well-versed in the promises of God long before there was a Juana's, long before there was, there was a Bible in every hotel room and two and a half of them in every single home. King Solomon is a man that's being raised in the awareness of the truth of his word and the promises of God. This is what the author of Hebrews is going to talk about when he says, when he's talking about meat Christians and milk tr- Christians and mature Christians and un- non-mature Christians and things, he says, everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he's a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have had their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. I love what he says right there. For those who have had the powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Church, are you constantly practicing to know how to discern right from wrong, good from evil in the middle of these trying days? In other words, what he's saying right here is a godly wisdom and maturity. It doesn't just happen once you ask. It's not as plain and simple as coming and getting into your prayer closet at night and saying, Father, just give me the wisdom to know what you would have me do. Oh, okay, that's it. Boom, I'm done. I've got wisdom for the rest of my days. No, it begins with the ask. It begins with the fear of the Lord, which leads to the ask. But then it continues with practice in learning the truth of God's word, kind of like an athlete who's training his body to be able to respond in the moment. One of my favorite interviews with Michael Jordan, it was back in the early days of his playing days, but it was right after one of the games when these iconic moments where essentially he goes into the lane, he jumps up, he's flying in the air for about 10 minutes, he's looking down on everybody's head, and he's going, oh, look at all those things going on down there. And then he decides to change arms, and his body contorts and flips and all these different kinds of things, and he makes the dunk, and it's incredible, right? Remember the interview afterwards, the, the reporters are going nuts. They're like, how in the world did you do that? Like, that's not a normal thing. How in the world did you do that when you came into the lane? Like, did you plan that out? Did you know that that's what you were going to do? And you remember what he said? He kind of laughed. He's like, you don't plan something like that. You practice for everything. You practice nonstop all day long so that you're ready to do whatever it is the defense gives you to do. I tried to, like, none of what he did is normal. Like, that's not normal. What Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, any of these athletes, what are these professional athletes are able to None of that is natural. None of it is normal. It takes years and years and years of practice to get to the point that that becomes muscle memory and reflex to be able to say, yeah, that's the right thing that I'm supposed to do. I remember a number of years back, I was playing a pickup game of basketball. It wasn't that long ago, and I got a fast break. I was kind of at the other end of the court, and I go down, and I go up to, to dunk just like I typically do, and... Um, <laughs> Um, okay, maybe not the dunk or anything like that, but I kind of, I went there, had the, had the fast break, and I went in for this killer layup. And, uh, and as soon as I planted, y'all, my legs just completely collapsed. Like the legs completely went out. You know what I'm talking about? Like you, you think that like you were when you were 19 and you're like, oh, my body can do that still. And you're like, no, I'm 43. That doesn't work anymore. Like the body completely crippled and collapsed. And it did not do anything. I'm going in there like, no one else is around me and I fall to the ground because I was completely out of practice. Hadn't trained for years. And the truth of the matter is that some of us are having a hard time with wisdom today because we've been out of practice for a really, 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 really long time. Our legs are wobbly. And quite honestly, the discernment, the wisdom, the 
The things that we think, it's not functioning like it used to function when you were hungry for the word of God in those college and young adult years when everything was brand new and glorious and you were just hungry for the things of God and you went to passion and you went to all these different kinds of things and man, you were just devouring it and you were memorizing the truth of God's word left and right and quite honestly, it's just not functioning quite the same as it used to. And again, it's not because you don't want to. It's not because you don't want it. It's simply because we're not practiced in learning the truth of his word and then letting the Holy Spirit lead. In other words, opening up the word of God and reading it and saying, God, what would you have me to do? Who are you? What is your mind like? What is your heart like? And then sitting there and waiting and saying, God, here are the tensions in my life. What, it is, what is it that you would have me do? And so when testing comes, we think things that are absolutely absurd. Things like, what's the problem with a little bit of flirtation? I mean, the wisdom of the world says, hey, it's just looking. You, like, you can look, you just can't touch, right? What's the, harm, what's the harm with a little bit of flirtation? I mean, everybody does it. What's the harm? Porn? Everybody looks at it nowadays, right? And we think things like that. It's, it's normal. It's natural. This is what guys do. Choose your own gender and identity. Yeah, sure, it makes sense. Sure, right? Abortions up to the time of a child's birth. Sounds like a great idea. Some of us never even started to train. And we're sitting there kind of going, man, it'd be awesome to be wise and discerning in the ways of God if there was only a book I could read. And the truth of the matter is he's given us everything we need to live in the wisdom that he calls us to walk in every single day. Just pages and pages of God. History, poetry, wisdom, literature, gospels, letters, just pages and pages of his mind, pages and pages of his heart, pages and pages of what he values and the decisions that he's made and the things that he's called people to do for years and years and years. I love the way Howard Hendricks says it, but he just emphatically, he's like, he's given us his word. He's given us the Holy Spirit. What else could we possibly need to walk in the wisdom of God? And so that's the hope of this passage, church. It's that if we fear God like Solomon fears God, that we care about the responsibilities that he's given to us, this, this family that he's called me to steward and to shepherd, my children that he's put underneath my care, my spouse that he's given me, my mom and my dad that I continue to care for, my coworkers, my friends, my companions, and the people that are in my life, that if we fear him and understand the responsibility, the opportunity that he's given to us here, and if we ask him for this wisdom, and we continue to practice understanding his truth and listening to the Holy Spirit, the promise in this text is that this is a promise, this is a request. He loves to answer. He loves to give it. Father, I don't know what to do. But God, I know that what my friends and what the world is telling me to do, it's not sufficient. God, I go, I want to know what you want me to do. I want, you to, I, I want to know where you would have me go and how you would help me maneuver the gray when all I can see around me is this gray. And so that's what he promises, that he's going to lead you into wisdom. And sometimes it's simply going to be the black and white wisdom of the truth of God's word. And it really is going to be that easy. Sometimes it's going to be the wisdom of a trusted community of believers that you are hopefully living with and in and among right now to this day. They're going to come alongside you, help you discern what's true and good and holy in his word. Sometimes it'll be in the context of a greater church outside of your smaller group of community. Sometimes you're simply going to have to go like Abraham and go walk by faith, understanding that the place he wants you to be is the gray, close to him, and just leaning on him the entire time. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from, uh, it's from Acts chapter 15. There's a line in there where the early church is trying to discern how do we do church with Jewish people and with Gentiles, two completely different backgrounds and, and everything going on with the law. How do we do church with them? And they don't know exactly what to do. And so they, they say this, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to move forward in this direction. That was their resolve. It's the resolve that we came up with a lot during the uh, during COVID 2020 and all the complexities of that time, as we pray and discern these really, really gray and mucky matters, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us to move forward in this direction. But this is what he calls us to do. After we come and after we pray, after we read, after we ask, after we listen, after we wait and wait and wait, and then we do it a little bit more and time runs out and a decision needs to be made, sometimes all we can do is just trust the Lord with all of our heart. Lean not on our own understanding is. Solomon talks about in the Proverbs, but in all of our ways, acknowledge him. Being confident and knowing 
that he will make your path straight. And so the practice this week is that we would get in the right rhythms of being a wise people much like Solomon, that we would crave the Lord's wisdom above our own, that we'd practice being a people who worship him in spirit and truth. But a few practicals are, number one is that you would leave here and that you may name the gray before the Lord uh, sometime this afternoon or in the morning or something like that, that we would name the gray that we're walking in right now. Father, it's this complex relationship that I'm here in here at school. It's this kid. It's this thing over here that we would name the gray and that we would go to him and say, Father, I want to know your wisdom in this. God, would you direct me? Would you lead me? Would you, would you take me by the hand? And would you walk this through with me? Number two, that you would start practicing or that you would keep practicing, knowing that some people you've been practicing for years and years and years and years. And others need to take that first step of starting, practicing, understanding the truth of his word and waiting on the Holy Spirit to lead. That you would take some time as you look in the, in the word of God, that you would look for the wisdom in the text. You may make those notes in your Bible and say, this is the wisdom that's found here in this text. That you'd write it out. That you would ask him for wisdom. That you would wait and you would listen. That you may be joining a Bible study, a men's or a women's group of people that are going to come along and help you discern these kinds of things. And if that's still not a possibility, that you would reach out and ask for help. We have men and women in our ministries, in the church, elders, pastors on staff that would love to sit with you and help you know how to be a man or a woman that's going to go to the truth of God's word and be in close proximity to him always. But again, church, knowing that it's not only for our own good, but again, like Solomon, that we would be able to care for the people that he's given us to care for really, really well, all for the praise and for the glory of his name. Father, we do love you, God, we praise you. Lord, we look to you remembering that you speak and things come into being. You knit together every bit of who we are in our mother's womb. You numbered our days. You gave us good deeds to walk in, Father. There's nothing beyond your power or authority. And so, Lord, we remember you. We fear you. We revere you. And so, God, we ask that you would come and that you would give us your wisdom today for the man or woman coming in and all they can see is the gray of that really, really tough and difficult situation. Holy Spirit, would you draw them in near? Would you speak to them? Would you lead them? Would you guide them? To be able to know what's wise as you define what is wise. Again, not just that we would have a better life, which we do in walking in wisdom, but that others around us, the people you've called us to care for, that they would flourish as well. All for the praise and for the glory of your name. God, we love you. Lord, we again, we praise you and we thank you for this day in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.